your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 4. We're going to look at that in just a few moments. But first, let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. Thank you so much for the opportunity to learn more about spiritual leadership through the judges. And I pray today, as we look at another aspect of spiritual leadership, we will see ourselves, we will see the call that you've placed on our lives, not just to be a prophetic judge, not just to be strong and courageous, but also to be humble. Because humility is a means by which we are teachable, Humility is a means by which we are usable to you. You cannot use someone who is filled with pride and a desire to rule. I pray, Father God, that you will teach us what this looks like through the life of Barak. In Jesus' name, amen. In Judges chapter 4, we're introduced to Deborah, and we know who Deborah is. She is sitting under the palm tree that's named after her. Why? Because the entire nation of Israel has literally seen and heard her being used by God to direct the nation in action. She is a prophet. So she speaks the word of God to the people and they understand it and they follow it. But you see, she was not just called to be a judge to the people, to get the people to know the voice of God. She was called as a prophet to raise up people who would be for the deliverance of the nation. And in verse 6 of chapter 4, we see that God is beginning to use her to raise up the people who will be used to deliver the nation. In verse 6 of chapter 4, it says there, she sent and summoned Barak the son of Abinom from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hands. Wow, great story. And she's already an established prophet. Now, can you imagine Barak? We don't know much about him aside from the fact that obviously he was in a position of leadership to the point where he could rally 10,000 Israelites to his side. It's quite possible he was a career warrior. It's quite possible that maybe he was just a tribal leader. But one thing we do know about this man is that through the discernment of the Holy Spirit, he was called to deliver the people. Now, first and foremost, here's the thing. He would never know that he was called unless the prophet made him know. So the prophet's job is to communicate the word of God. And guess what? In a sense, the prophetic role continues today through your pastors, through your teachers, through the ones who come forth and tell you what the word of God says. That is not the, the guy who's going to deliver in the sense of doing the work of deliverance for the nation, but they're the ones communicating the mind of God so that you might understand your role in the deliverance of the nation. You know, people have this idea about prophets and about pastors and about teachers that if a church is not necessarily doing well, that it's because the pastor or the teacher is not doing the work of the ministry right. Well, guess what? And I'll be the first to say this. Every pastor must be held accountable, of course, to the way that they teach, the way that they communicate the word of God. They are responsible to tell the people the full truth, regardless of whether they like it or not. Because it is only the truth that's going to be able to inform them as to how to behave, how to do the will of God. But guess what? If the pastor or the prophet's role is not combined with the role of the one who is humble and ready to do the will of God, the nation will never be delivered. 
This message is primarily a message for every single Christian under the sound of my voice because every single Christian has to understand this. When God calls upon you to be used for the deliverance of the nation, you are now a spiritual leader. You don't have to have a position as a deacon or an usher or a pastor or anyone else to be the spiritual leader that God has called you to be. Why? Because every single one of us have received a commission from the Holy Spirit. And once we hear it communicated clearly, the responsibility now lies with us to fulfill the word of God and to see God work. For every single Christian who is frustrated with their church or frustrated with the, the level of lethargy or, or people's lack of enthusiasm concerning the work of God, listen, the reason why people remain this way is primarily because those who know, those who know exactly what God wants to do are not about God's business doing it. And that's why the work of deliverance takes so much time. Because along with the gift of prophecy has to come the gift of humility, the readiness not just to hear the word of God, but to do it. Now, Barak didn't know this. Barak's role was essential to what God needed to do. But it began with this. And it, it begins this way with every single humble judge or humble leader of God. You must be able to discern the will of God regardless of where it comes from. It's quite possible that Barak had heard about Deborah. It's quite possible that Barak may have even visited Deborah and received guidance from her before. But now here comes the word of Deborah, specifically sent to him via courier. Listen, God has called you to muster 10,000 troops from these particular tribes and to go up against that enemy general, Sisera. And he's going to come at you with his chariots and his troops. But guess what? God is going to deliver him into your hand. Now, if you read previously in the chapter, Cicero had been combative against the people of Israel for many, many years. In fact, for 20 years, Cicero had been used to oppress the people of God for 20 years. You think in 20 years no one ever came up against him? Of course, but they failed. And the Bible talks about these chariots of iron that he had that scared the people. Now, I can well imagine when Barak heard he's going to be the one to be delivered, immediately in his mind, it triggers the idea, but wait a minute, I know who Sisera is. I know the danger that he brings. I know no one has been able to beat him. But God is telling me that I need to go and to come up against him. Can you imagine the fear, the anxiety, the thought that, one, again, am I going to let God down? <laughs> but guess what? In this portion of scripture, we don't hear him saying, no, I can't do that. We don't hear him saying, no, I don't think that's true. We see him ready to go. And that, my friends, is the characteristic of a humble judge. A humble judge doesn't look at themselves and say, oh, because of my insecurities or because of my fears and my anxieties, I'm going to ignore what the prophecy says. or I'm going to ignore what the word of God says. No, they place themselves in a position where no matter what it is, if it comes from the mouth of God, I need to be ready to do it. That's humility. That's not putting your pride before God. That's not putting your fears before God. That's not putting your concerns about the future before God's will. A humble judge always puts God's will before their own or before anything else. It is also quite possible that he could have been receiving this prophecy from the, from the mouth of a woman like Deborah. 
And in that moment of fear, he could probably say to himself, well, God has never really communicated his will in this way before. So why is it that I need to acknowledge it? As a man, why is it that a woman should come to me and tell me what the will of God is? He's quite possible, it's quite possible that he could have done that as well, but we don't see him doing that. Why? Because it doesn't matter what the vessel is that communicates the truth. If it's the truth, I need to obey it. That's a good way to think about humility. Sometimes people will say, well, if that person told me, then I'm more prone to obey it versus that person. <laughs> I like the way they communicate, not the way these people communicate. And sometimes people are like that. Like, if it was someone else saying it, they would be gung-ho and all for it. But if this other person says it, nah, I need a second or third opinion. That is why a spiritual leader should not be someone who is just going with what's popular or going with what is comfortable, but someone who is committed to the will and the word of God regardless of where it comes from. You know how many times as a pastor, I've had to sit back, not just with other theological minded people, but I've had to sit back with people who are newly saved and hear them say some things to me that I needed to hear. And I've had to learn from those people. If I was a type of person who was so prideful about myself and about where I am spiritually, then I cannot be teachable. And if I'm not teachable, then how is it that I'm going to grow spiritually? As a pastor, I must be ready to receive the truth from anybody. From another pastor, from an apostle, from a prophet, from a lay person. If it's the truth, it's the truth. And I have to be humble enough to accept that. Let me ask you something. Are you only humble in receiving the word of God from particular sources that make you secure or make you feel comfortable? Or are you willing to receive the word of God anywhere it comes from if it is the truth? We don't know much about Barak, but one thing we know is this. When God speaks to him, he's ready to go. And that's humility. That's humility. You can't be an effective spiritual leader without it. Think about even Jesus Christ in the way that he ministered. Do you think that Jesus didn't know the hearts of men? In fact, the word of God makes it clear in, in multiple portions of scriptures in the gospel that Jesus saw the hearts of people. He knew what they were thinking. Now, can you imagine if you knew what everybody was thinking? Many of us would be so angry every moment of every day. We would hear the words coming out of people's mouths and be like, yeah, really, really? I don't think that's true. <laughs> we would be so cynical and we would use the knowledge that we have to exalt our pride and our way of thinking. But you see, a spiritual leader is able to take their pride and to put it to one side for the glory and honor and exaltation of Christ. And Christ's will to be accomplished. That is so important. So being a good leader means being able to discern the will of God well. Do you take the time in, on your day to day to go forth and to discern the will of God? To ask God today, Lord, what is it that you would have me do? And do you wait on the Lord? Do you say to yourself, I won't make a move until I know for certain that this is God's will for me? That's a humble person. That's a humble leader. That's someone that God can use. Discern the will of God. That's what Barak did. He heard the words of the prophet and he immediately went forth and did it. The second thing is this, in order to be a truly good and humble judge, it's always important to seek help, to seek help. Look at verse 8 of Judges chapter 4, it says there, Barak said to her, this is to Deborah, 
if you will not go with me, I will go. I'm sorry, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, sometimes when you read portions of scripture like this, it sounds as though he's making an excuse so he doesn't need to go. But that's not what he's doing. He's basically saying, I need the voice of the prophet to be with me as I seek to do the will of God. Why? Because it is the voice of the prophet that guarantees the outcome to be what God wants it to be. I think Barak is saying basically, if God gave you that commission to tell me that I'm going to overthrow Sisera, if you gave me that, I need for you to go up to vouch for what God is about to do. I'm sure Barak wasn't thinking, I'm going to put a sword in Deborah's hand and she's going to fight on our behalf. No, he simply wants the word and the will of God to go up with him. And that's what humble leaders do. Humble leaders always acknowledge that despite their skills and their abilities, they need God's help. Because without God's help, everything that he's promised will not come to pass. Barak is showing forth humility here because he's saying to the prophetess, listen, I believe in the word of God and I want the word of God to go up with me as I seek to do God's will. You know, most of us, we, we want to serve God. We want to serve God in church, we want to serve God at our workplaces, etc. But this is how we usually do it. We know that we're supposed to do this, but we never seek God in prayer. We never seek God in terms of discernment as to how to deal with things and deal with issues and situations. We simply go up with our own skills and enthusiasm. And then as we go up with our skills and enthusiasm, we're realizing that we're fighting in spiritual warfare and those same skills that would probably be good in normal times, they are of no use in spiritual warfare. And we get, we get frustrated. We say, you know, I've been trying to serve God, but I'm serving him from my understanding of how to do it, not from the power that he's giving me to do it. So we get frustrated, we get tired, and we give up. Because you can't fight spiritual warfare with physical and intellectual tools only. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to go up with you so that you are empowered in ways that you were never empowered with before. Barak understands that. He's a warrior, but he knows many warriors have already gone up against Sisera and they failed. The only way I'm going to go up and beat Sisera is if I go up in the power and under the unction of the prophetess. She's the one who said what God would do. I need her with me to confirm that as we go. So as I go, if I will go up with you if you come with me. I'm not going to go up if you don't come with me. He's saying there, I need the word of the prophet to go with me so that I can accomplish what God says will be accomplished. A humble spiritual leader is not thinking about their skills alone. They're thinking about God's power, God's enablement to do the work. That's why as spiritual leaders, if you never spend time with God, if you never spend time talking about how God is impacting your life, if you never spend time meditating on his word and praying with other spiritual leaders, you will not have the power for the work that he's called you to do. You will get burnt out. And I know how people are, I mean, I know how it is in my life. If I'm not walking in, with God in the way he wants me to walk, I am struggling in terms of the things he's called me to do. I don't have the energy for it, I don't have the time for it, and I certainly don't have the confidence for it. Humility is important to being a good leader. You have to discern what the will of God is. Listen to the voice of the prophet. But you also have to seek help 
When was the last time you prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, empower me for the calling you have placed upon my life to serve you? Not just waking up every day and going through the motions, but stopping to ask for special enablement from God. That is a means by which we are able to serve and to overcome. The humble judge understands this. Thirdly and finally, look at verse 9. In order to be a truly humble spiritual leader, you have to stay faithful in spite of the lack of acknowledgement. Verse 9 says this. This is Deborah answering Barak. She says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Well, can you imagine that? She's saying, hey, go up against the general Sisera. You will overcome him, but guess what? You're not going to get the glory for it. Guess who's going to get the glory for it? Another woman. You talk about a shock to the ego of an Israelite man. First of all, this woman is the one who gives him the instruction. Then this same woman says, you're not going to get the glory for it. Another woman is going to get the glory for it. You talk about a cultural shock, a test to his understanding of his manhood. This was it. I'm going to risk my life. I'm going to put everything on the line and the lives of the men that follow me so that somebody else can get the glory for it. You know, I know so many people, especially in church ministry, who will not get up and serve God unless the money is right, unless the commission is right, unless you're going to get the acknowledgement that you need, they won't do it. You know, unfortunately, as a pastor, even in my previous ministry, I would get in contact with ministers, people who I thought were truly spiritual-minded, and I would tell them about something that I think God laid on my heart for them to do, whether it's ministering to young people or ministering at a crusade or something. And so many of them would say to me, so what's the money going to be? What's the money going to be? And that was always a bad sign for me. You know, I, tell me about your schedule. Tell me about something else. But don't tell me about money as your first question. Because to me, it sounds like a business transaction as opposed to a spiritual calling. And I've literally had men and women say to me, look, I like what it is you're trying to do, but you know, you're gonna have to take the money amount up a little bit more, otherwise, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it. Now, am I saying that it is not important that we take care of our ministers and care for them in terms of their tangible needs? Of course we must. But if the motivation for doing the ministry of Jesus Christ is that dollar amount, then we have a serious problem. A very serious problem. It is your sense of calling that inspires and motivates you to keep going in ministry. If you don't have a sense of calling, as soon as the going gets tough, you're out the door. But if you have a sense of calling, you will never leave. Or even if you believe God is calling you to something different, something new, you will go into that situation fully making sure that the ministry you're a part of is good, is made right. Why? Because you're not doing it for the money. You're doing it for the ministry to deliver the people of God. That's what a good and humble spiritual leader does. And they're not afraid to be left in the corner with no handshake or no hug or even no remuneration. If it is for the glory of God, they don't need the glory for themselves. They can be satisfied with their role. And why I think this is so important in this story is this. You see, the woman who ultimately got the glory for, for um, getting rid of Sisera, she never would have had the opportunity to get that glory unless Barak did his part. 
The Bible says, Barak went out in verse 10, he called out Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh. 10,000 men went up um, at his heels and Deborah went up with them. And up there they find Sisera. And the warfare happens. And as the prophetess said, Sisera fled before the face of Barak. The Israelites had a great victory. However, the main guy, Sisera, got away. So of course, even though Barak is celebrating the fact that they won, they still haven't fully won because the bad guy got away. And so they're pursuing him, Sisera. And Sisera knows they're coming after him. Sisera goes and finds a tent somewhere. And he goes through the tent and there's a woman named Jael in that tent. He goes to her and as most evil men do, he uses his power of position to try to manipulate her. He says to her, look, I'm going to come and hide in your house. And I'm going to tell you, if anyone else comes to this house asking about me, you tell them that I'm not here. Because if you tell them I'm here, they're going to want to hurt me. You must protect me. And Jael, in her wisdom, she says, okay, fine. And he goes into her tent, and she stays outside, and eventually he falls asleep. But guess what? Jael knows who he is, and Jael knows the danger that he poses to the nation of Israel. And in that moment, someone who probably wasn't trained as a warrior, somebody who probably was just a normal woman going about her business, God put within her the courage and the strength to do something to do something to actually fix the issue. And the Bible tells us, gives us a story of what she does. She takes one of the tent pegs that she used to keep the tent together. And she gets a hammer and she goes into that tent while he's sleeping and she performs a coup d'etat on him. She puts him to sleep for good. And funnily enough, here comes Barak, here comes the armies and they're saying, where's Cicero? And what does Giles say? Giles says he's right in there. <laughs> and they walk in to find that man dead. Why? Because a woman, just a normal woman going about her business, seized upon the opportunity to destroy the enemies of God. You see, you don't need to be a king or a queen. You don't have to have the leadership um, you don't have to have the, the title or anything else like Barak did. All you need is to be ready at the time God calls for you to do what God wants you to do. And you can end up with the glory and honor that God says will be given to those who are faithfully used by him. Now can you imagine Barak under normal circumstances pursuing this guy thinking once I get this guy we're going to be safe. And then he walks into that tent and sees that somebody else did it. There are a lot of leaders who would probably think, you know, I wanted to be that one. I wanted to be the one who people say got this guy. But not Barak. You see, he doesn't need that. He doesn't need to be the one. <laughs> he doesn't need to be the guy. He just wants to see God's will done. And whether it is done by him or somebody else, he is happy regardless. Why? Because he is a spiritual leader. Let me say this, my friend. Spiritual leaders are only concerned about the will of God being done. They don't care by who. They don't care who gets the glory. They just want to see it done. Nothing gives me more joy than to see people being used by God in ways more powerful than I could ever be used. It makes me happy. <laughs> when I think about what God is doing with the Ignite group, I get excited. I don't go as much as I could, but I'm so thankful that there are those committed to it and are doing it and God is working. It makes me happy. I'm excited when people serve in this service. This wonderful service where people come and they play the music and they, they testify and they, they share the goodness of God. That is what gives me joy. 
And when the time comes for accolades or whatever, listen, you don't have to mention my name. As long as the people of God are good and delivered, my job is complete. That's all I want. That's all I want. You don't have to put no plaques up, nothing like that. You can even forget me. <laughs> as long as the people of God are delivered and good, I'm fine with that. And that's the kind of leader that God wants. Someone who's not egotistic, someone who doesn't need the shine in order to do his will. Someone who is just simply committed to seeing the prophecies fulfilled in the lives of the people of God. Barak is a very unique man, very unique for his time and very understated. Some of you may have never even heard of his name until now. But you see, Barak represents the kind of leader that prophets need. Prophets need humble leaders. Humble leaders are people who hear the word of God and love it and are committed to it, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Humble leaders are people who are always seeking the help of God or the help of others so that the work of God might be done. They're not kamikaze soldiers. They're people who go in there with strategy and with help because they're interested in God's will being done. And, of course, humble judges are people that stay faithful in spite of the lack of encouragement or the lack of acknowledgement. If Barak did not pursue Sisera, Sisera would not have gotten to Giles' tent. And if Sisera didn't get to Giles' tent, God wouldn't have been able to deliver Israel. Barak needed to do what he did, and he needed to stay faithful in doing it. He could have very easily on that hill said, okay, there goes Sisera, yeah, we won. We don't have to pursue him anymore. But no, he did what God told him to do, and because of that, God was able to use someone else to finish the job. And that's the work of the ministry. That is what spiritual leadership is supposed to produce. It's supposed to produce the ability for others to raise up and to do the will of God with the giftedness that God has placed within them. I see every single one of you here as Giles. You are that woman who is able by the will of God to finish the work that God has started through the prophet. But it means that you yourself have to know and be willing and humble enough to be used by God in that way. I'm hoping that I can be a Deborah, I can be a Barak at times. And my prayer is that if God has placed those giftedness within you, that you will be a Deborah, that you will be a Barak. But it is the combination of those two things that God uses to deliver the people. And it's also so wonderful to see him do that in this portion of scripture. God delivers Israel because of the humility of a man. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be humble judges, that we, be, we would be humble spiritual leaders, that we would take the example of Barak, that we would be like him. We wouldn't get so caught up in our ego. We wouldn't get so caught up in the need to be the leader, to be the one who sets uh, the action for that, Lord, we would be active ourselves, doing what you've called us to do. Lord, we may not receive acknowledgement for it. We may not even sometimes receive encouragement for it. But if we are doing the will of God, we are in the right place, and Lord God, you will use our service to deliver your people. And that, Lord, is all we want. We want you to deliver your people. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing our prayers. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.